perspective of ontology. Uh, so I'm not a performer. I'm really interested in what this experience does to the minds of people who experience it, and if it has any significant long-term uh, political implications. So uh, the majority of this theoretical framework was completed during my master's thesis at the Aesthetics and Politics Program at CalArts in California. Uh, but I have recently, <laughs> I mean very recently, within the last month or so, experienced a wide range of other events. So it's originally just going to talk about one performance today, and that's still what I'm going to do in my presentation. But it's my hope that maybe we can have a very interesting uh, conversation during the Q&A, and we can bring in some other experiences to really kind of complexify that understanding. Uh, what I'm going to do first is offer a reinterpretation of Deleuze's essay, Postscript on Control Societies. So, I'll do that right now. Uh, first published in 1990, in this very short five-page paper, Deleuze covers an impressive amount of territory. In it, he theorizes the widespread transition away from the Foucaultian uh, disciplinary society into a much more pervasively sublimate society of control. A quote, the operation of markets uh, is the instrument of so-called control and the impudent breed of our masters. Control is of short term and of rapid rates of turnover, but also continuous and without limit. End quote. Mechanisms of control replace previously disciplinary methods. Political subjectivity is reformatted at nearly every step of the social education process so that we might feel that corporate systems and neoliberal ideology are the only viable options available to us. Deleuze ends his essay with this sentence, a solemn warning. The coils of the serpent are even more complex than the burrows of a molehill. What is meant by this? The first implication is fairly obvious. A serpent is usually a living thing. Its coiling is able to adaptively respond, tighten, and relax in an intricate play designed to elude any hope of its victim's chance of escape or lines of flight. The second implication is less obvious. No one is really sure how many snakes there are, or explicitly where they live. By making control a matter of access and possibility, Deleuze was already well ahead this time. Arguably, the unfolding of global events in the last several decades only serves to show the many ways in which he was right. However, there is another type of control which he did not mention. This is the emergent form of non-institutional control, uh, which I would really place starting around the 80s and 90s, but manifesting very strongly in the 2000s, and most recently, uh, with the advances in semio-capitalism and cognitive capitalism. Uh, second point, it's certainly possible that the structure of neoliberal society traps it within a reductive cultural feedback loop that isn't really being controlled directly by anyone. Such concerns are detailed explicitly by a wide array of uh, writers, including Marcuse, the one-dimensional man, Arendt, and the crisis in culture, Berardi in Precarious Rhapsody, or Lo Ponty as early as 1951 in an essay about America's big business, and De Bord, the Society of the Spectrum, among many others. With the increasing digitization of communication and the perceptive environment, automatism tends to become the prevalent reaction to stimuli. The rarefaction of authentic communication with otherness and its replacement with pre-formatted interfaces of thought and action has begun to distort the filters of social perception, disturbing how we actually relate to real people in the spaces around us. Immersion within an increasingly commercialized, semiotic environment effectively leads, at times, to a near-total appropriation of aesthetic perception and sensibility for capitalistic ends, negatively impacting any chances we may have of developing catharsis, harmony, 
of solidarity with others. Collectively, we begin to learn a language of sublimely apathetic detachment, a mentality which must be resisted at any cost if we actually care about the future of this world. Inhumanity is quickly becoming the prevalent form of collective social interaction as human re relationality devolves to little more than a system of capitalist value exchanges. It can be rightfully argued that we are losing the ability to understand each other, and in doing so, we are also losing the ability to understand ourselves. <clears throat> Neuro Sorry. Uh, yes. Neuroplasticity is the idea that the brain adapts the development of its neurobiological architecture according to how we use it. Over time, the plasticity of the brain and the corresponding flexibility of its thought rigidify it into a more solid structure. Traditionally, it's been widely thought that the slowdown of neuroplasticity is just a side effect of growing old. And partially, it is. But nothing about becoming an adult means that we have to stop learning. Uh, more so, I would theorize that this coincides with about the time when we think we understand, or at least think we understand how to interpret, and therefore stop challenging ourselves in interesting and innovative ways. The performative conditions of new labor within cognitive capitalism reorganize the capacities of long-term memory into a more functional, shorter-term working memory, effectively developing a machinic intelligence within people. This produces changes within the material of the brain, affecting the connection and firing of neural synapses, the physical aspects of thinking, as well as its mental concepts, which increasingly become related to productivity and profit maximization. These are not simply ideas but instead entire ways of thinking that extend to all parts of life, well beyond the boundaries and the confines of the working environment. The last quote we're going to uh, reference from Deleuze's essay also happens to be my favorite. There is no need to fear or hope, but only to look for new weapons. So I submit to you this idea. If audiovisual flows can be used to control, they can also be used to liberate. This is a quote from Warren Edich. To understand the true emancipating power in the moment of cognitive capitalism, we must understand it in its neuromodulating capacity. To recap very shortly, uh, neuroplasticity is essential for literally every moment of our lives. Uh, it affects how we learn, how we create, how we understand each other, and how we grow as people. So it's a shame that this gets arbitrarily short just because of the structure of the place we live in. Why I'm interested specifically in noise music is because I believe it can have power to really reactivate neuroplasticity within the mind. It, uh, it does so by agitating the mind, uh, inducing both a deeply profound meditative state, as well as, <coughs> as, well as a heightened sense of focus, which is all too often becoming very rare in contemporary society. The idea of visual music is nothing entirely new. Even some of the earliest cinema was an abstract progression of patterns that can be understood more musically than cinematically. Uh, painters like Klee or Kandinsky, their paintings are understood rhythmically. So I don't think it's a leap of faith to say that in audiovisual performance, what we have is a superposition of audio music and visual music. Sometimes these coincide, and today, uh, this, this has usually been an act of retroactive decision-making, 
Uh, you would normally create uh, a musical performance, compose a score, and then look for visual displays that would somehow complexify this or, or add other layers. And the reason I'm talking about zones of influence today uh, is specifically because it takes that entire dichotomy and it puts it on its head. Uh, in this one performance uh, in 2014, what you have is two musicians interacting through a software interface, which changes the notes that they play, so they aren't really sure what they're playing, only that they're playing. The whole process really resembles more of a ritualistic summoning of an experience than the direct control of a musician over an instrument or an environment. Uh, I'm going to quote David Rosenberg uh, right now discussing, discussing the piece. Uh, Zones of Influence was written during 1984 and 1985 for William Wynette. We premiered the various parts of Zones of Influence in succession as they were completed and subsequently performed them in many concerts in the U.S. and Canada for about 10 years. At that time, the electronic parts were realized with the Touche, a digital keyboard instrument developed by Donald Buchla and myself in 1979. The interactive technology required to realize zones of influence has evolved through several iterations. The version offered today is the first that finally realizes all aspects of the propositional musical model envisioned in the mid-1980s. The reason I said this just now is to make the example that people have had ideas for artistic experiences that were meant to physically stimulate the brain as early as the 1980s, even as early as the 1960s, but it hasn't been until very recently, a, a year ago, two years ago, that we've had the technology to make this a feasible reality. And the reason that this is important is because the cross-modal stimulation that you would experience in an event like this directly parallels several forms of uh, meditative school of thought that use sound and vibrational energies to strengthen the nervous system in such a way that you might use weight training to strengthen a muscle. Uh, we can literally enhance the carrying capacity of the nervous system and in doing so, literally increase the amount of awareness we have at any one time. And this stands in striking contrast to what's happening in the greater digital environment uh, that we find ourselves in pretty much everywhere these days. Uh, the way that people design popular music, the way that people design cellular video games, or even websites, is in such a way that they're explicitly meant to be addictive, repetitive. They short-circuit the brain into these like very minuscule feedback loops that preclude any possibility of otherness. And maybe this wasn't so much of a pressing concern 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it is now. People are being born into these environments and scientists can objectively state that their brains are developing differently than human brains have ever developed before. And we don't really know what the full implication of this is. But it's quite possible that in not having moments of meditative silence, you know, it's very easy to carry your phone or the internet or technology with you almost anywhere, that we're really limiting the possibility of uh, developing any sort of higher conscious faculties. Of course, this is all theoretical, but uh, I, believe, I believe it's still very poignant. Uh, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, I believe audiovisual performance can be used to kind of facilitate what might otherwise be known as a spiritual experience, but in an environment that's free from religious dogma and totally uninhibited by the normal boundaries of sociocultural interpretation or language barriers. Uh, and I'm very interested to see if any of you are responding to this <laughs> at all or have questions. Um, and then maybe go from there. Uh, I can get off in tangents and 
I'm starting to do that, so I want to, I want to keep the conversation directed at what you all are interested in. Uh, 
of the performance as a whole rather than specific notes. And it, it's those little lines of movement which are then reformatted, or not reformatted, but they combine with each other in such a way to create what can only really be described as a constantly evolving uh, kaleidoscopic mandala vortex. Um, and the only way to really describe this experience, which that part alone went on for probably 20 to 30 minutes, was the sort of anti-brainwashing, at once both hypnotic, but you could also feel your brain activating in ways that it had never done before. Because this is really one of the first times where the music was creating the visual display, instead of being you know, superimposed retroactively. And so what we have is like a very rhythmic, synchronous pulsing of different areas of the brain, a uh, sort of cross-modal stimulation. Uh, and if you go back to some of those yoga techniques I activated earlier, uh, there are explicitly these same techniques that have been like passed down for thousands of years by very very limited esoteric circles for strengthening the nervous system in such a way that you are creating the preconditions for a sort of moment of awakening. Uh, now the thing is, at least where I live, not many people practice this type of yoga and many, many more are off put by the idea. And what's even more so is it's incredibly difficult to maintain that sort of sustained focus. So the reason I'm interested in experiences like this is it's much, much easier to convince somebody to go to an art show that they think is going to be cool. And if it has the side effect of supercharging their mind and creating new neural connections between previously disassociated networks, then that's icing on the cake. But I mean, really, it's the most fundamental thing we can hope to do to our brains because it's it's helping us think better and more creatively for the future. Um, I, don't, I, I hope that answered your question. Well, I was just triggered the, 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 the word silence. Yes. And then you had this kind of issue, design silence. Yeah. The most kind of design silence. And then you had this, this connection between the cage of the awareness and the noise of the awareness. Yes. So that's the kind of association and the analogy. Yes. And juxtaposition with pop music. I heard this on the radio last week. It was an interview with one of the one of the big wigs of the Swedish pop music factory talking about his one key to success has been to create a catchy chorus that people can just kind of sing along to in any circumstance, introduce it earlier in the song, and repeat it more often, essentially making music one chorus. Uh, based on the same chords that people already listen to. And so, if you look at something like an Indian raga, which could last 60 minutes or more, uh, based off of like a circular musical structure that really activates a lot of different areas of both the mind and the brain, compared to a productive pop music song, which has the effect of essentially putting the brain to sleep, uh, Since I'm severely jet lagged at the moment, and I apologize profusely for that. Um, but, but yes, if we could have some questions and maybe uh, as weird as anyone would like them. I, I don't quite understand. You just made a difference, differentiation between the pop music, which you said is about and the other, which I could different areas. Yes. I don't quite understand what you mean. Could you elaborate on that? I think it's interesting. Sure. But I don't really. Okay. Um, what we have as soon as music uh, starts to become popular enough to be commercialized is it inevitably, and except for like a very small number of outlier examples, 
becomes increasingly formulaic. Uh, the complexity of the musical structure diminishes, uh, you know, in direct relation to the cost associated with it in terms of time and production value. Uh, more so, people who are already addicted to a certain type of music want to hear that type of music. Uh, even if it's not going to actually stimulate their brain to respond any differently than it responds to a song that sounds similar because it has a similar rhythm, uh, same chord progression, uh, similar, often meaningless lyrics. Uh, uh, versus uh, a much longer, and it doesn't necessarily have to be an Indian raga, but something, something which requires some degree of focus um, to hold it together for longer than a period of three to four minutes, which is actually an investment, um, where there is sort of a uh, breakdown of the barriers of the ego as soon as you, you know, get past a certain threshold. become more fully immersed in the song. You can let it flow through you instead of experience it, <coughs> experiencing it from the perspective of an external, detached observer uh, who's judging it rationalistically. Um, I hope. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, please, anyone else? Thank you very much. You have to go to church. 